Sherman Alexi describes himself as a storyteller around a campfire. I would describe him as a writer who can sucker punch me every time with the power of his words about his characters, their sadness, their humor, their courage, and their compassion. The authenticity of his voice with which he describes Indians reaches across cultures to connect the reader to these characters and to the human truths that unite us all. Sherman is a member of the Spokane tribe, also of the Coeur d'Alene people. He's a graduate of WSU and a nationally acclaimed novelist, poet, and filmmaker. He's a winner of the National Book Award for Young, people, or for young People's Literature. For the book was titled, The Absolutely True Diary of a Part-Time Indian. He has won numerous awards for his novels, poetry, and screenwriting, including the Penn Faulkner Award. As a baby with life-threatening illness, one of six children that a single mom struggled to support because his father was often absent, his father suffered from alcoholism. Sherman grew up surrounded on the reservation with poverty and outside of the reservation with racism. His writing powerfully reflects his experiences, sad, tragic, joyful, and profound. The San Francisco Chronicle describes his writing as emotionally spring-loaded, linguistically gymnastic, and devastatingly funny. So gather around the campfire. We're here to welcome Sherman Alexie to our podium. That was a nice introduction. Those always make me self-conscious. They always feel like a dating ad. <laughs> so, yeah. Indian writer in search of total strangers to validate my meager existence. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Sherman. Uh, it's good to be here. It's been about 10 years since I spoke to the Rotary here in Seattle. I love the Rotary. They gave me money to go to college. So, well, not you. <laughs> you could have. And, and, uh, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, when you have a small Rotary, like my little town did, you know everybody. So it, it's nice to be here and to think about people I haven't seen for a long time and the meetings and the singing and the bells. And I really enjoy watching, uh, you know, a lot of white people having a really cool ceremony. So, uh, <laughs> I got to sing with you, so I'm going to overcome. Uh, it was good to hear Julius. You're doing amazing work. So I'm here to talk about my father today. It's been 10 years since he died, and... Uh, I miss him, but I get to see him every day when I look in the mirror. <laughs> more and more and more and more. And, uh, you know, the gray and, and the cowlick is getting lickier and, and uh, uh, this thing. <laughs> you know, I, I saw an interview with me, and it's the first time I've ever seen it actually move independently. <laughs> like there's a thing on my neck. Uh, he was a Coeur d'Alene Indian, a lifelong alcoholic. His father died in Okinawa uh, in World War II when my father was only six years old. And then his mother died six months later of tuberculosis. So my father and his sister, my aunt, were war orphans. Uh, but the irony of that is that because of the death benefits, they actually ended up being very upper class for reservation Indians and ended up moving with their grandmother into Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, and went to Coeur d'Alene Catholic. I'm Catholic and Indian, guilt squared. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, every time I'm in church, it's like, I'm colonizing myself. And, and uh, <laughs> You know, Jesus on one shoulder, Chief Joseph on the other. And, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, you know, I grew up on the reservation very poor. Uh, didn't have electricity or running water until I was seven. Uh, 
you know, I remember when Sears brought the toilets with the tribal grant, we got the BIA grant, and I can still see them big, strong guys carrying in the gleaming white toilets. I mean, we knew what they were, we just didn't have any in our house. And, and uh, so, grew up poor, uh, sick, I was hydrocephalic, and uh, that was life. And when I first started traveling with this career, uh, I mean, the first, second time I ever got an airplane was to go give a poetry reading uh, at this very prestigious university back east. I won't tell you its name, Harvard. And, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if there are any Harvard grads in here, but, you know, you're really arrogant. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, you can set your watch. As soon as you start talking to somebody from Harvard, you can, you know, like within two minutes, they'll mention that they went to Harvard. Could have been 65 years ago, and they'll still mention it. Uh, and, and then I always come back with, "Yeah, well, I'm a cougar." <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> well, I gave a reading at this university, and I read one of my early poems. And in this poem, the father character gets drunk at her New Year's Eve party, takes li gets really angry, and takes living room furniture out on the front lawn and burns it. And I guess the same event occurs in this Russian play I'd never heard of, this 19th century Russian play. Uh, the professor came up to me afterwards, this English professor, Harvard, you know, and he goes, uh, you know, he mentions this play. Uh, and, you know, he mentioned the playwright I'd never heard of, had a name something like Consonant, Consonant, Consonant Nev. And, and, uh, <laughs> and I said, I don't know that play or that playwright. Uh, I, and, and he said, well, you must have been influenced by this. The same thing happens. The father character gets intoxicated, gets angry, takes furniture out in front of the home and burns it. You had to be influenced by this. I said, no, I mean, I, I'm not an expert in Russian literature. I guess maybe he thought it was because of my last name, Alexei. <laughs> and, uh, and to explain that, I would have had to launch into a long and detailed discussion about colonialism and the missionary position. And... and uh, <laughs> And, uh, 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 he, no, I'm not, yes, no, yes, no. He was monopolizing my time. Uh, it wasn't a big line, it was early in the career, but still, he was monopolizing my time, and we were arguing, you had to be influenced by this. No, you had to be, no, you had to be, no, you had to be. And I said, finally, very angry, he said, well, then what were you influenced by? And I said, well, you see, there was this New Year's Eve party at my house. <laughs> my dad got drunk and then my dad got angry and then took our living room furniture out on our front lawn and he burned it. And the professor looked at me and, and he said, oh, so did your father read that play? I mean, the thing is, with being an Indian in the United States, everything feels surreal, and everything feels fictional, uh, because we are so bombarded with images of us that have nothing to do with us, uh, you lose track of what's real and what's not. And, and even when you write autobiographically like I do, people assume it's something else. You know, it's either the environmental leftist superhero or the right-wing warrior Indian, and it, we're all in between. And, and, uh, uh, and so I kept writing about my dad, uh, as with many men, all of you men, I'm sure your most contentious relationship is with your father, or, and if it isn't, then, you know, screw you, and, because uh, you're lucky and the rest of us hate you, because uh, that's what men do, uh, we shake your hand to smile, but in the back of our mind, we're thinking, I wish I had your dad. Please. <laughs> and I knew his father died in Okinawa, but we never talked about it. We never talked about much. Uh, we talked sports, basketball. So, you know, we'd call each other up. Hey, Dad, how you doing? Did you watch a game last night? Which meant, I love you. And, and uh, he'd say, yeah, man, I hate that Kobe, which meant... I love you too, son. And that was the extent of our emotional connection was surrounded by basketball, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, the idea of men bonding through sports. Uh, you know, my wife, our marriage became better once she understood that, and it became even more better when she became bonded over that as well. You know, so now we talk sports all day, so I'm married, I'm married to the perfect woman. And, uh, 
she's hot too, but uh, that's actually way down the list from the sports thing. And, uh, and he never understood why this career worked. I remember coming home from college after my first uh, poetry writing class, and I showed him poems, including the house fire poem. And uh, he said, well, I guess these are good, but why would anybody be interested in reading about us? Why would anybody be interested in reading about Indians? And I couldn't answer him then, and I really can't answer him now. Uh, I'm still surprised by it. I lived a small life in most ways, in the smallest corner of the country, called a reservation, and people are interested. It's crazy. It's maddening at times. As an Indian, as a reservation Indian, you're sort of born with this natural inferiority complex, which I still carry around a lot. And my father, of course, always had it. Now, because he went to Coeur d'Alene Catholic, because he had the money, uh, he actually ended up being prom king. He was an incredible athlete. He was jitterbug champion of Coeur d'Alene, Idaho in 1958. The nuns taught him how to play classical piano. He sang Hank Williams. You know, he played the saxophone. He was an amazingly talented guy. But in that era, when an Indian kid graduated high school, if he or she graduated high school, there was no college. That wasn't even part of the culture. It's barely part of the culture now. It's barely part of the expectations. So when he turned 18 and graduated college, the death benefit stopped, and he slowly faded. Now, when my first book came out and I started traveling with it, my name is Sherman Alexi, Jr. All over the country, I did 25 cities, all over the country, his former classmates from Coeur d'Alene Catholic would show up at the readings because they saw the name. And I'm pretty sure there are only two people in the history of the world who had that name. And they would show up and see me and realize, oh, that must be the son. But my father was so talented and amazing in high school that they fully expected and weren't surprised that he would have this book and be traveling the country with it. You know, and they were CEOs and lawyers and doctors and athletic directors of D1 colleges, and, and there was a movie producer, and just this amazing range of wildly successful people from that school who were his friends, who were his girlfriends. And when they would ask me, well, what's your dad doing now? And I would tell them he's a randomly employed blue-collar reservation alcoholic. You know, I could see the sadness in their face, of course, but something deeper. And it's still unnameable to me. I've tried to write about that look in their faces, that huge psychic pain involved in that. Sometimes I think I was just looking in a mirror. A few years back, I was part of an uh, exhibit at the Museum of Tolerance in Los Angeles. Now, I didn't know what it was before they called me. I'd seen the sign when I was in town, the Museum of Tolerance, and I just thought, wow, that's aiming low. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, wow, I tolerate you. Uh, that was in our vows. And, uh, and uh, of course, then I found out what it was and felt really bad. Uh, it's, it's, uh, you know, it was originally a museum to uh, uh, talk about and, and remind us of the Holocaust. And it had since broadened its mission to include the notion of tolerance and understanding between all cultures. And they decided to do this American quilt and invited uh, representatives from every racial group. Well, not all of them, uh, but, you know, the big ones. And, and, uh, and, and because of my career, Indians finally get represented in these things. So they asked me, and I was with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Michelle Kwan, Steve Young, Billy Crystal, Joe Torre, Christina Saralegi, Maya Angelou, just this incredible lineup that I spent a week with. It was and, and terrifying and fun. And I ended up, uh, Oprah called. Oprah. 
and she invited me to come to the show. And they sent out a crew to interview me beforehand, and whenever a media crew comes out, uh, and they're talking to me about where they want to shoot and what they want to do with photographs and film, you know, I can always, you know, they're always, so, is there anything, uh, you know, that you do around town that's, you know, a thing you do, you know, that's cultural? <laughs> Which I always know, you want me in front of a totem pole, don't you? <laughs> you want me in front of a totem pole. <laughs> so, I usually end up standing in front of a totem pole. I've got cousin, a cousin who makes the Kama Sutra on a totem pole, so I always want to stand in front of that one day, because <laughs> you can't really tell unless you study it, so uh, I thought that'd be fun to be on Good Morning America with. <laughs> so they interviewed me, and, and I talked about the medals that my grandfather won. Uh, the thing we learned through the Museum of Tolerance is that my grandfather had won 12 medals in World War II. My dad didn't know it. Nobody knew it. It was a reservation Indian in World War II. Nobody paid much attention. They gave him the medals and nothing ever happened. Twelve medals, twelve medals. Bronze Star, two Purple Hearts, Valor, all this other, I mean. And uh, I applied to get him reissued and the army told me that it would take years. There was a waiting list which angered me greatly. Can you imagine a waiting list to get medals? And uh, so they interviewed me and I said I didn't want the medals to be about anger or war or violence. I wanted them to be about closure and forgiveness. So I ended up on the Oprah show. I had the flu, by the way. I, had, I didn't eat for 36 hours beforehand. At one point, I just threw up a cantaloupe ball. <laughs> I don't even like cantaloupe, so I don't know where that came from. <laughs> It's like the cantaloupe ball transubstantiation. And uh, that was a Catholic joke for you Protestants. <laughs> for your benefit. Uh, and on the show, Oprah started talking to me, but she sounded like a Charlie Brown parent. The thing is, that's what I remember. I mean, that's the thing you learn about memory when you're a fiction writer, is that it's, everybody's wrong. That thing you remember, that thing you've been fighting with whoever for however long, you're wrong. But the good thing is they're wrong too. <laughs> Human memory is completely fallible. All I remember is Charlie Brown, Oprah Charlie Brown parent. But I was having a conversation with it. You can get the tape. I'm talking to her. I'm making some sense. And, and, and... And, and then she says, and this came roaring clear in my memory, she says, well, Sherman, we have a surprise for you. Here is Special Forces Brigadier General Leslie Norris with your grandfather's medals. So the general and two officer assistants came walking out from backstage, and being an Indian and seeing uh, people in U.S. military uniforms, <laughs> you know, I had this, you can see it, uh, <laughs> I, I, you know, I stood, you know, and I was in a, you know, triple threat position. For those of you who know, no basketball, I was ready to drive, shoot, or, or pass, but really ready to run. And, and, uh, and, and they came walking toward me, and, and in my memory, they're gigantic. They're just this three huge men, just giants of the earth. And the thing is, if you look at the tape, they're actually much smaller than me. I mean, I look like an NFL middle linebacker, and, you know, and they look like they've just carried the ring to Mordor. <laughs> <laughs> and they hand me the medals in this beautiful box, and they hand me a flag, and, and, and I'm standing there, and everybody's crying. It's an Oprah show, so they're, but they're even crying more than usual. And, 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 and I'm, I'm standing there thinking, because the thing is, I didn't tell my dad about applying for the medals. I didn't tell my dad about the interview. I didn't tell my dad I was going on Oprah. I wanted to surprise him because I think it's important for total strangers to uh, give you the medals to symbolize the worst pain of your father's life. I, I think it's important when you bring strangers into that equation. I think it's important to have Oprah do it. 
But I'm standing there thinking, oh my God, oh my God, I can't believe I did this. I can't believe I did this. I did it. I came on the show. Yeah, it was about the medals, but really it was to be on Oprah. It was to be on Oprah and maybe sell books. I'm a capitalistic whore. I'm a capitalistic whore. I'm a capitalistic whore, 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 whore. Now, I don't know if you have that kind of inner dialogue. <laughs> Maybe you get through it. Uh, but I ended up going home and gave him the medals. And for some reason that allowed him or compelled him to stop dialysis. It gave him the kind of closure to where he let himself go. He let himself die. I ran from him that night, the last night but not before he uh, was sitting there in bed. And he kept talking about the angels in the room, which freaked me out because he was an atheist. <laughs> and I'm agnostic, and I'm thinking, okay, just morphine, morphine angels, morphine angels. Talked about the light on the ceiling. Then he saw the poster for Smoke Signals, which features the three main characters. And in the middle is Irene Bedard, who is gorgeous, gorgeous Alaskan native. And my mom came in and stood in front of the poster in such a way that she had replaced Irene Bedard. And my dad looked at my mom and he said, Lillian, you know, we've been married for almost 40 years and we've had laughter and joy and pain and these amazing children who've given us joy and magic and loss. And I look at you now standing there looking so beautiful and I keep thinking, I should have married Irene Bedard. <laughs> and we broke out laughing so hard, my mom and I. And then my dad slipped into the coma he did not wake from. The last thing he said to us was a punchline. The last thing he said to us was something really funny. So after a lifetime of pain and loss and agony and war and oppression and colonialism and racism and classism. My father found the spiritual strength at the end to be funny. We had a contentious relationship. We had a sad relationship. But he left me with this amazing gift. And because of him, I can laugh my way through anything. And that's how I survive. Thank you. We got a few minutes for questions. This guy scares me. He, I know. He's, he's, what's your official job title here? Pompatia? Pump, what? Puppeteer. Oh, okay. I thought pump, wow, you, it's some secret language with the rotaries. Okay, we have a question from Nicole. Thank you so much. I've been aware of all of your work. I just had no idea how, what a wonderful speaker you are. So thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, I won't mention what school I went to. I'm just going to say on behalf of the folks I might have gone to school with, I'm really sorry about that, Professor. I probably had him for class. <laughs> um, and here's my question. I'm also a professional writer, and I always ask writers, um, please tell us about your daily routine to write. What do you do and how do you do it? Because those of us who write know how amazingly difficult the profession is. Can you share what you do on a daily basis to get the work done? Well, I generally... You know, I have deadlines for books, and then I work backwards to when I think I have to start a book, and then I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> and then at some point I realize that 12 days is probably not enough time to finish the novel, so then I have to extend it with my publisher. Uh, I'm a binge writer. Uh, I write poems all the time. Uh, but with uh, short fiction and novels, it really is, I sort of collect ideas. Uh, in fact, the last time I was downtown, I, you know, I saw a very interesting, I, I don't even, I can't even quite, I don't, 
I have an issue with reality. Uh, for years, I, I was convinced my wife had once told me that she broke up with a guy because his favorite song was Desperado. And she said, no, I never dated anybody like that. And we argued for 12 years about this. And then we were sitting on the couch one night and an episode of Seinfeld came on and Elaine told Jerry, you know, I broke up with him because his favorite song is Desperado. <laughs> You know, it was one of those moments in a marriage when you're not, you know. I, I never noticed that the ceiling, you know, has... But, but it, it all sort of comes together at one time and then I'll spend 16 hour days writing for a month. Uh, and I, I keep it outside office. I'm a full-time writer, but I rent an apartment to use as an office because I started that when the boys, my sons, were very little, because would I rather play Legos or would I rather spiritually suffer through a novel? Legos. Uh, so, uh, but I have Legos at the office. And, and uh, so it's binge writing. Uh, it's very unpredictable. Uh, I, I, I wrote this morning, but that doesn't mean I'll write tonight. We have a question from Anne. Hi, thank you for your moving portrayal of your father today. That was very, very interesting. Um, I'm right, I wanna know, I saw a video with you just recently um, where you talked about the coming demise of literature because of electronic uh, readers, like the Kindle and whatnot. I believe it was on the Colbert Report, and that was in 2009. So I'm wondering if your views on that have changed or if you think we're still off the cliff. Uh, I was grumpier then. <laughs> uh, I mean, I still have serious issues with the business practices. Uh, you know, in old-fashioned business, the book business, that was really collegial. Uh, Amazon has turned it into a cutthroat business just like any other. Uh, Amazon introduced this rapacious sort of monopolistic uh, capitalism that really hurts. Uh, and for a while, it seemed that independent bookstores would be threatened by e-books, and it, was, it trembled, but actually there are more now than there were two years ago. Uh, so I feel pretty confident in saying that independent bookstores are going to be okay. Uh, that said, uh, Amazon is trying to dominate the world. They want to be the publisher, the editors, the publicity, the warehouse, the manufacturer, and uh, it's very dangerous for any of us for that much power uh, in, in a thing called the literary world. And do you really want to be buying your books from the company that's in court trying to store the CIA's online records? Uh, that's the kind of power they're aiming for. So my objections to electronic literature now have everything to do with the business practices. And, and I love the aesthetics. You know, I can't wait to get holograms. And, but that's where I stand. Uh, my entire backlist is going electronic here in about a week, two weeks. So for those of you who are addicted to those little machines that have no soul, you can buy them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question. Mark? Sherman, it's so great to see you here today and to hear from you. I, mean, I loved your interview that you did with Bill Moyers recently. And something you said struck me. You said you wanted the public Sherman to be closer to the private Sherman. Can you explain what you meant by that? Uh, if you don't know, Mark was actually my first interview uh, in Spokane many years ago. Uh, I still have the VHS tape, and it was my first TV interview, so uh, nothing moves except my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> my niece at the time was watching, and she goes, Uncle, what's wrong with your neck? Uh, well, the difference between a private and a public life, uh, you know, as public figures, we really try to portray ourselves, often try to portray ourselves as having special knowledge, special abilities, special insight. That may be true in some regard, but it's completely inaccurate in others. Uh, we pretend to have answers. You know, and in my real life day to day, I am clueless. I stagger through life. I don't know how to balance a checkbook. You know, my computer goes down, I don't know. I'm, my sons confuse me constantly. Uh, I don't, you know, they're privileged little shitheads. I have no relationship. 
with that, you know, I, you know, <laughs> that's what they, they call themselves that. That's what we talk about. Don't be, you know, you're a privileged shithead, but don't be a privileged asshole. And, and uh, uh, so to get up here and to be that person and, and not portray myself as something larger than I am, that I have all the same weaknesses and strengths that you do as a human being, uh, I just happen to be better at metaphor. Uh, that's the thing. That's what I'll admit to. None of you are better at metaphors. <laughs> Not even close. There's, there's maybe like 300 people in the world who are better than me at metaphors. Probably not even that many. Uh, but everything else, I'm terrible. So, thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know we'd have a parenting lesson, but thank you, Sherman, for that. Um, we have a great program today. And it's thanks to Seattle Rotary Online is made possible in part by a grant from First Choice Health, working with the Washington Health Information Collaborative to use technology to bring better health care to patients throughout the Pacific Northwest. First Choice Health, 